to have you join with us again this week as we continue to look at our series on how to. This week's theme? How to resist. James tells us in chapter 4 and verse 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 9 resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world and so we thought it'd be great this evening we talked about prayer for the last two weeks um, this week we thought it'd be great to start looking at what it is to resist but in order to be able to resist we have to know what resistance is so a definition of resistance is to keep something at bay or to fend off its influence or advance. So to, in, the, in the case of temptation and so on, it's to stop it from having any influence on us, to stop it from advancing into our lives and to keep it at bay. Now, James makes some really clear statements about temptation, about troubles and difficulties, those things that we might mix up between temptation and trials. And he says this, he said, in chapter one, he says, don't let anybody say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. Because God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And that's a great place to start, I think, is this idea that when we're talking about temptation, when we're talking about resisting, understanding where temptation comes from is key to being able to stand against it and hold your own. And it's important to remember that temptation in itself is not sin but acting upon it and giving into it and allowing it to take a foothold in our lives. That's when we fall into sin. So resisting is about stopping ourselves from being drawn away by our own desires. It's about not letting ourselves succumb to those thoughts, feelings, wants that so often overwhelm us. And we're not just talking today about the obvious things like gluttony, or sexual immorality or theft those are obvious temptations but there are lots of others as well aren't there yeah have you ever thought about tempted to be fearful the temptation to have a pity party the temptations to be um self-absorbed temptations of pride you know i think sometimes we get so overwhelmed by the idea that depression is something that just happens to me but actually it starts with its root in allowing myself to start feeling very sorry for myself about circumstances and situations. Fear would be similar, I think. Yeah. Fear, so often there's an anxiety, there's a concern. I'm not talking about obvious necessary fear. There's a tiger running down the street that's about to bite my legs. That's what fear is for. It kicks in all sorts of chemicals that give me the fight or flight reflex and allows me to survive. It's a, it's a natural part of our biological nature. But fear of the unknown, fear of the what if, the temptation to dwell in things that haven't happened yet and things that haven't taken place, that, that's the danger of temptation in fear, I think. Yeah, and, and it involves taking our eyes of God. Always. Whenever we keep our eyes fixed on God, fear cannot take foothold in, in our lives. It's this idea that everybody says, oh, the devil's giving me a hard time today. Oh, the devil's giving me trouble this way or that way. But actually, if we look at what the devil is giving us trouble with, he always gives us trouble with the things that we desire with our own desires in which we can be enticed and often we blame things on the devil to the point that 
we almost make him omnipresent and that's not one of his qualities only god is omnipresent that's and right. can be everywhere at once the devil can only be in one place at once often we are tempted by the old man the old man trying to rear yeah. his head within our lives and take us back we often say that our, our three greatest enemies in life are the devil we're told the adversary um, is the devil the world of course all around us there's temptation that's, that's a real enemy to us at times but more than these two our biggest enemy is ourselves and that's where temptation really has its battle is in ourselves so when we talk about how to resist how do I stop myself from giving in to my wants to my desires how do I resist in a way that allows me to live a victorious, successful, godly life. That's a question of how to resist. I think it helps to know that um, nobody is special in their temptation. No, temptation is common to all of us. Um, whether Christian or not Christian, we are all tempted by things. How many times you go shopping and you're tempted by that well not at the moment but you're tempted by that <laughs> lovely new dress or and and chocolate cake or that handbag or chocolate cake yeah <laughs> temptation is common to the whole of mankind it's not just a unique experience for christians but the way we deal with it is different in fact paul writes to the corinthians and the corinthians were well known for being quite a carnal church they gave in all the time to lots of desires and wants and Paul writes to them, and amongst other things in his letters to them, he says this, no temptation has overtaken you, except those things that are common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with every temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This first thought, we're not going through something that is worse than anybody else we might go through something different but not worse because temptation is the same for us all we all face temptation trouble trial yeah and i think there's a great danger the first area in which we give up and stop resisting is we begin to convince ourselves that somehow poor pity for me no one else goes through things like i do no one knows what it's like to experience these things like I'm experiencing. But actually, the Bible's very clear. We're all going through the same trials, the yeah. same temptations, the same troubles. It might look different for you than it does for me. It might look different for you than it does for me. But emotionally, spiritually, in our heart of hearts, we're all going through the same trials and challenges. Yeah. And, and to end up in that place where you start thinking, I'm the only one facing this, is already a step in the wrong direction. It's a step towards defeat and not a step Absolutely. to victory. So one of our first steps in learning how to resist is not thinking for one minute that I'm unique or in some way what I'm facing is unusual because, well, Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. So as we talk about these things, we notice the second thought that Paul brings in Corinthians when he says about no temptation has overtaken you, which isn't the same for everybody else. He says this, he said, God won't let you go through what you can't cope with. So whatever you're going through, God knows you can cope with it and God knows you can stand against it. Absolutely. Just because you don't feel like you're able or often want to, the truth is that God has not let you face anything that you cannot handle. See, temptation brings a desire to fall into a sin, uh, doing or not doing something that you should be doing. Hmm. It doesn't make you sin. You still have the choice to say no or to say yes. Oh. You, I'm sure you've seen um, the cartoons or the comic books 
Um, I'm sure I've seen in Dennis the Menace sometimes and he'd have a little angel on one side and a little devil on the other and the one telling him to do wrong and the one telling him to do right. And it's listening to those voices and choosing which one has the greatest <laughs> power in our life. That reminds me. I, I remember a little boy once said to his mum, you mean Norman. My name's Norman. Not no. Because every time he asked for things he couldn't have, his mum would just say, no. And when we raise our children, we never raise our children and just say yes to everything. If we do, if we did, we're not very good parents because children need to learn the difference between what they can have and what they can't have, what's good for them and what's not good for them. So giving them a tub full of ice cream just to keep them quiet is not a good thing. It's actually poor on your part. It's temptation to end ceaseless nagging from little ones and give in. But a good parent says no, with good reason. And so when we come to temptation, we've got to look at ourselves and say no. That's where this whole resistance thing begins, is with saying no. Try it. I, I remember a pastor friend of ours who would say quite frequently, you can't stop a bird landing on your head, but you can stop it from making a nest. So those thoughts will flitter by, but you don't have to dwell on them. You can dispel them straight away and dismiss them and say, no, I don't want that thought in my head and change your thinking. So the third thought from this um, verse in Corinthians as we're looking at them, um, this idea of temptation is this that god doesn't tempt us we saw that in james that we're tempted by our own desires we saw that in james and in peter but what we see here is that though god doesn't tempt us he helps us yeah god is our very present help not just in practical real life situations but in the trials and turmoils of temptation god is there ready to help and that's why paul writes to the corinthians and he says he will also make the way of escape but we've got to choose to listen mm. and choose to bring god into that um choose to walk with him through it and take that way of escape you know sometimes i think we give in because actually we want to it's something we enjoy doing um and we refuse to let God in and stand against it. So let's look at this. Um, we talked as an introduction about this whole idea, but let's look at this in a little more detail. And this evening, I want to just bring to you four simple thoughts on how we resist. The first is we apply the Bible, God's word. Luke tells us an account of Jesus being tempted. Yeah, in chapter 4, verses 2 to 4, Jesus being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was very hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God. Even the way that Jesus answered the devil in temptation was by the word of God. And if you read the rest of the account of Jesus being tempted in the gospel accounts, you'll see how he was tempted three times and three times he replied with scripture. He replied, it's written, this is what God has to say on the matter. This is the way I'm choosing to live my life. And so that was how Jesus dealt with the devil himself when he came to tempt. You notice what we said earlier about temptation. The devil didn't come and test Jesus in an area that he'd created. He tested Jesus in an area of Jesus' need and desire. Jesus was hungry. But what the devil did, he turned it so that there's nothing wrong with having something to eat when you're hungry. But the devil turned it and said, go on, use your power. Mm. Don't go down the road and get something to eat. Use your power. Make a miracle just for your own selfish needs. And so what the devil was doing, he was pushing Jesus to act in a selfish way. And Jesus' response, 
It is written. And, we, and we've talked previously in the weeks when we've done about prayer, that praying God's word and how powerful God's word is. It's alive, it's a living thing, like a, a, as a sword and a hammer and as a fire. And we can resist temptation applying God's word. I think it's important that if we're going to resist, we need to know what God's word says. Yeah. Now, you may not be a great scholar. You might be a very lazy Bible reader. I don't know. Maybe you read the Bible every day. Some people hardly read the Bible at all. Five minutes over coffee on their YouVersion Bible app, a quick flick through the scriptures or the scripture for today, and that's their Bible reading done. That's not getting to know the word of God. When we know the word of God, it begins to shape our thinking. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But what it does, it affects our understanding of who God is, yeah. of what God requires of us, and how God reacts when we act rightly. So knowing God's word becomes a real stepping stone in resisting temptation. Because if I know in the Bible it says, you shall not kill, and I'm tempted to strangle my wife because she's burnt the chips for the 97th time. I'm kidding. But if I'm tempted to get angry, I'm really angry and not be someone and start thinking about murderous thoughts. The word of God tells me that's wrong. So there's no excuse. I know it's wrong. I just have to recognise that. Take it further. If I get really, really, you know, fed up with my old banger and my neighbour turns up in a brand new sparkling sports car and everybody's turning their heads and looking at it. Well, the word says, I shall not cover. In other words, I won't desire what someone else has and want it for myself. So when I know the word of God, I know what God's standards are. There's no excuses. There's no letting myself off the hook and trying to, oh, well, I didn't really know God, so I thought I'd do it anyway. That's just poor Christianity. Because God's word tells us what God expects of his children. And that's why we know what the standards are and what we are resisting and why. And like in life, we can coat things with a substance that would make it fire resistant. Or we give people medication that makes them resistant to um, certain infections. And if we apply the Bible to our lives and God's word to our lives, then we become resistant mm. to temptation. It's like, uh, uh, it's, it's a coating to us. We coat ourselves with God's word and it helps us to be resistant. So going back to this idea Carius was saying about praying God's word, that's a second thought tonight on how to resist, is first we apply God's word. Second, we pray God's word. We pray. We call on God. God says, call upon the Lord while he's near. Call to me and I'll answer you. Call, shout, cry out. And there are countless accounts in the Bible of those who were facing trials and temptations and turned to God and said, God, will you help me? And at the very moment of their need, God turned up in all his power and helped them. In Matthew 26, Jesus is about to face the biggest challenge of his ministry, the laying down of his life, suffering and dying on a cross for our sins. And just before that, having had a great evening with his disciples, they'd had a Passover supper together, they'd celebrated some Passover, they'd gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, a quiet evening in the garden. And Jesus starts to pray because he knows he needs God's strength and God's help. So he's asking God to help him. And as he begins to pray, the disciples fall asleep. And, and he comes and he says, look, you know, can't you stay awake and pray with me? And then he says this in Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, it's amazing how often we fall asleep when we're trying to pray. <laughs> it's um, another one of those temptations. And that's why Jesus is saying, you've got to watch. You've got to be alert. You know, back during the Second World War, it's like, be alert. Always be watchful. Oh. Just in case, you never know who somebody may be. 
and yeah Jesus is saying be alert be watchful be prepared be praying yeah there's a great phrase in the Psalms about um, a man who's fallen into trouble and he says this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his distresses and then another place he brought me out of a horrible pit. In other words, I got myself into a really nasty situation. I was stuck in a very horrible place. And he brought me out. He brought me out. How does God bring us out? We cry out to him. We pray to him. We remind him of his word, knowing that he's faithful. And if we say, God, you said this, then we know he'll do it. Just like our children. If I say to my children when they were little, if I said to them, okay, we're going to the beach on Saturday, and then I'm praying really hard, it's sunny because the children don't really appreciate the fact that if it's raining, we don't go to the beach. Because I said we're going to the beach on Saturday, so the children always expected that on Saturday we would go to the beach. That's how our Heavenly Father is, and when we remind him of his word, he says, yeah, I said that, of course I'll do it. And so, applying God's word and praying. And not just praying round the houses, oh God, give me one and one, oh God, let me have this, this one time. That's not resisting. That's not really working for what is good for us, let alone others. And, and so when we're resisting and we're talking about how to resist, then really we need to learn to pray, God, give me what I need. Mm. God, help me with what is right. Yeah. Just one word of warning on prayer to deal with a certain temptation. If you're prone to being impatient, Hmm. or getting angry and losing your temper and you ask for patience be prepared because the bible says tribulation works Not patience, patience. <laughs> be careful what you pray for and, and it's this idea that we we learn to live by god's word and then we learn to commune with god pray to god so that's the the second idea prayer and then the third idea and it, it's developed from the first two is to be spiritually minded so I apply God's word, I pray to God, and then I become transformed. Yeah. In fact, what Paul says to the Romans in his letter to the Romans, verse tw uh, chapter 12, verse 2, he says this, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, just because everybody else on the planet is doing it, if you're a child of God, it doesn't mean to say that you should too. It's being transformed from that earthly way of thinking to kingdom thinking. Um, the world thinks all about me. It's all about me. I am the centre of my world. Yeah. But kingdom thinking is it's all about God. He is the centre. He is the most important. And, and I want to see him glorified. And it's having that renewed thinking, that renewed mind. Um, a renewed mind of living in victory, a renewed mind in putting others first, putting God yeah. first. When he writes to the Galatians, Paul says this, he says that I say, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And this word lust, it's often misunderstood in our modern society, in our popular culture. We like to bend words and lose their true meaning. But lust means this, it means I must have it. I must have it now. I want it. I must get it uh, and so lust has to do with a driving urge in the bible when it talks about lust it's a driving urge to have or do something to get it or to be it um it's not necessarily about just sexual immorality though today lust is often just associated with sexual sin and sexual temptation with pornography adultery and immorality but actually in the bible when it talks about this not fulfilling the lusts, plural, of the flesh. It's talking about all the wants, all the desires, yeah. all the things my body wants, my mind all wants. All those cravings. All those yearnings. Yeah. And so that's what the Bible is talking about when it says becoming spiritually minded, walking in the spirit. So walking in the spirit, you've got to know God's word. Because if you're walking in the spirit, you have to know what God says. Walking on in the spirit, you have to know what a relationship with God really is. Mm -hmm. You can't walk in the spirit if you've just made lip service to salvation yeah. and said, well, I want to be a Christian too. 
you have to have a life-changing encounter in order to walk in the spirit. And it's why fasting is a good principle, Mm. be it fasting from food or fasting from social media or TV or whatever your pleasure is. It helps us to subject our flesh to our godly nature, to our spirit. It helps us to bring flesh under control that our desires do not dictate our actions. Just a word of note to parents, you cannot fast from your children. That is not what fasting is all about. (laughs) Being spiritually minded is really important. And and it's this idea that we transform our minds, we become renewed in our minds, we change the way we think, we change our attitude by spending more and more time learning the ways of God. Mm. A craftsman doesn't learn his trade without first taking up the tools and learning the trade. This doesn't come magically mystically God does help there are supernatural promises and supernatural moments when God breaks in to help us in our own inabilities but the truth is if I'm going to become spiritually minded I have to pursue God with a passion I have to chase after him with all my heart with all my soul with all my my strength with all my mind and this idea of learning to think the way God would have us think rather than the way the world would have us think is one of the great keys to growing in our ability to resist. What I was tempted in when I was younger is very different from what I'm tempted in when I'm older. As we get older, our desires change, our priorities change, and so our temptations often change too. And it's recognising with every season of life what temptation looks like. Mm. Temptation is really at its core about being selfish either for myself or for those that I think are important in my life so just because I give lots to my family that doesn't make me selfless it makes me selfish for me and mine and and so learning to have a godly mindset isn't just about doing good to mine it's about living these Christian principles out in everyday life for everybody Jesus says love your enemy love your enemy it's part of God's word. Yeah. And, and so this idea of being spiritually minded, it's what helps us learn how to stand strong. Being spiritually minded when I'm tempted to fall into self selfishness and depression, when I'm tempted to fall into fearfulness and worry and stress and anxiety, because they are temptations. The causes may be very real, but our reactions are still temptations yeah. that we give into. And that's the challenge, is not giving in. And so our fourth point this evening, we've looked at the Bible, knowing God's word. We've looked at prayer. We've looked at being spiritually minded. But the fourth point, and I'd say probably when it comes to our part in this, it is the most important part in how to resist. The fourth point? Self-discipline. In our thoughts and in our actions, we learn how to behave right and then we do it. And if we don't, then we're just giving in to temptation and we're not resisting. Corinthians, Paul writes and he says, um, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. What he means by that is not, I beat myself with a stick every day. Mm. That's a misconception. The correct way to look at that is that's a perversion of God's word. When you start self-harming, inflicting pain, hurting yourself in order to subjugate your flesh, that isn't God's word. Subjugate in, bring in my flesh under my rule is about my mental discipline in learning to tell myself no in learning to stand against the things that i would otherwise want on a whim i love a chocolate bar or three Mm. it's so easy every time i walk into the kitchen to get a drink or to let the cat out or whatever else i'm doing to stop by the cupboard and grab a chocolate biscuit or a bar of chocolate. It's so easy. 
And I could tell myself, well, it doesn't matter. And in the big scheme of things, it doesn't really. But if I don't want to become 20, 30, 40 stone, then I have to learn to be disciplined. It doesn't matter how big you are. That's not what the issue is. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not our size. But if it affects my health, if it causes me upset and anxiety because I feel bad about myself, then that's an area I learn, need to learn to put my discipline into. It's about me having self-discipline. Go on. Uh, and as we've said, every skilled artisan, every athlete, they have to train in what they're doing. They have to be disciplined. They have to put the time mm. and the effort into what they're doing. See, these things don't often come naturally. No. They take a lot of effort, a lot of energy on our part, yeah. a lot of... But if you want to achieve it and you want to be the best that you can be, then you're prepared to do it. Mm. And when it comes to being the great best disciple, being the best follower of Jesus that we can be, we have to put self-discipline. We have to put energy and yeah. our. We have to put our actions and our will into it and make the right choices. When I used to work for an employer, forty hours a week in an office, well, forty plus hours a week in an office. If I didn't turn up on time, there'd be discipline. There'd be consequences. If I didn't do my job when I turned up at work, there'd be discipline. There'd be consequences. It wasn't my self-discipline. Someone else applied discipline for me. And through life, <clears throat> when we're in school, when we get a job, we are disciplined by other people. It might not be harsh discipline. Sometimes it can be inappropriate discipline when we're dealing with people who lack emotional um, well-being and take it out on employees or their fellow workmates. But either way, the truth is, when we go to school, when we go to college, when we go to work, there is some form of discipline. One of the greatest challenges that I had to apply when I came full time into ministry was to learn to be that discipline for myself. To get up at a good time, to spend time doing the things that I need to do, to study, to pray, to spend time with God, to make sure I carry out the business of work that's needed to be attended to for the church that I serve. But the truth is that it took self-discipline to make sure I get up and get on with the day. It's the easiest thing in the world to get up and think, you know what, I'll have, I'll have a down day. I'll not shave today. I'll hang around in my slacks all day. I'll just lounge around and take it easy. There's no problem with having a day off and a day of rest. God gave us a day of rest, although he meant it for our spiritual development. But there's something about getting up, girding up. That's a biblical phrase for tightening your belt, getting yourself ready for the day, and then facing the day. And there is something very healthy and very liberating about having discipline. But when we've never known discipline, or we've only ever been disciplined by others and resented it because we don't like other people telling us, then we're on a real challenge when it comes to learning how to resist temptation because we're going to have to learn how to be disciplined mm. in ourselves, in our thoughts and in our actions. I'm terribly sad to say that in our society, a lot of our society tend to act with whoever's watching. So I won't steal because people might be watching. I won't do this because people might be watching. You think of some social media cases where people thought that someone wasn't watching. Think of the lady who, um, for some unknown reason, unbeknown to herself or anybody else, walked along the road, picked up a cat, Left it up a bit, wheelie bin lid, dropped the cat in the bin, closed the lid. No one understands why she did it. She couldn't even explain why she did it. But somebody was watching and goodness me, didn't she pay the price for that? And in our society, of course, we are watched constantly. They are now talking about a COVID-19 
app for your mobile phone which traces who you're in contact with so that you'll actually be tracked who you've contacted who you've been near and and it will work in a way where the government will be actually able to tell who's been near who talking to who when it's a very very ominous shadow of things to come in terms of what revelation talks about but in terms of here and now it's just another way in which everybody else takes responsibility for our discipline but when i take responsibility when i discipline myself I am able to resist. I am able to stand. Mm. I am able to see the victory I long for, but often despair that I don't see because I am able to do all to stand. And that's what Paul talks about when he writes to the Ephesians and he says, and having done all to stand, stand. Yeah. In other words, hold out, resist, put up your obstacles against the things that would otherwise get the better of you and resist temptation and if you do trip up and if you do fall into temptation don't beat yourself up no. don't go on that downward spiral and mm. make it worse just come straight back to God and tell him you're sorry and ask him for the strength to resist next time mm. I just want to encourage you that you don't give in and you don't quit running the race just because you slipped up. Right. You know, no athlete wins yeah. every race from the minute they start. They all have to lose at some point. It's part of our growing. So if you've made any mistakes, just come back to God, put yeah. it right with God and carry on. Keep moving forwards. God is faithful. Well, that ends our thoughts this evening. Just want to remind you before we go, tomorrow there'll be a prayer meeting in the morning, 10 a.m. You'll be able to join us for our live um, prayer meeting broadcast. And then don't forget, Thursday is Phone a Friend Thursday. We're encouraging you to phone non-Christian friends, those in your wider family and friend circle who might not know Jesus. And just minister something of the hope and the peace and the joy that we have in him. But until we see you next time, we're praying for you. God's watching over you. May the Lord bless, keep and fill you full of his peace. In Jesus' name, we'll see you soon. <laughs>